Right. It's been so long. It's been, oh God. It's been so long since I've done one of these. Uh, I've done a vlog. Uh, I've been wanting to come back for a while. I really have. <sighs> no. It's been a minute, hasn't it? Uh, how you doing, guys? Um, I'm really nervous. <laughs> old boy's getting old. I knew. Oh, Rain Rain. New Rain Rain. Oh, beautiful. Now I go to the gym and then. Hello, oh. boy. Hello. Oh, you beautiful. Look at that little grey beard. I'm not taking you because it, when it's raining and I need to concentrate on this, I will take you when I get back. A good boy. Yes, she is. Yes. A really good boy. I'm so lucky to live in a place close to this. I left the army in 2014. Since leaving the army up until two years ago, I haven't stopped. I've pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And I think there's a reason behind that. You know, I had people asking me, what, you know, how can you do it? Vlog, stream, work. You know, I was doing 12 hour shifts. There's certain things that I just wasn't facing up to. And I think that's why I pushed myself so hard because I wasn't hiding, but I just wasn't facing up to some of the things that I've been through. There's also other things as well that I've had to, over the past two years, unpack and address. Like many people nowadays, grew up without a father. And my father was from a time that women weren't really respected that much. He just didn't have the facilities to be conscious enough to understand his words, his actions, and you know some of the things he did. I forgive him, I really do forgive him because I understand it's not his fault really. To move on with my life, I've had to forgive him. My mum brought me and my sister up on her own. She's all through my life, my mum's been my angel. She really has. She's been an absolute legend and I wouldn't be where I am today without my mum. She's caught me when I've fallen so, so many times. I mean, this is what my father was like when we was young. You know, we all love Marmite. And he had a post-it sticker on it saying, hands off mine. Um, another time, I mean, back then, life was a struggle. We got, we got past the noise. He went out one day and he bought a pair of glasses, believe it or not, that looked like Elvis Presley. God knows why. You know the ones with the circles coming down here? Um, it cost him 200 quid back in the day. Well, equivalent today is probably about a thousand quid. So my mum stamped on him. Yeah, she stamped on him. And he just wasn't a very good father. He didn't have the facilities. You know, it wasn't his fault. Um, so she left him. He never paid a penny for us. And he used the money against her to make her struggle. But she says, sod it, I don't want your money. I'll do it on my own. So she had two jobs. She'd be taxi driving in the day. And then at night time, we had, uh, it was a council house um, under the stairs. She had a little cubby hole. And back in the day, to, we used to have cables that connect the TV to the video. So I had like a, a red, a white, and a yellow one. She had to, she was soldering them together. She had about two P for each one of them. And that's how she made extra money. My dad didn't care, he just didn't give a damn. When I was 13, I was the sort of kid that was looking out the window. I was sort of oblivious to everything. And I got all ungraded at school. I really struggled at school. And I went, she sent me to live with my dad. And all he did, he just... It was a real hard time. Really hard time because he manipulated me to get custody off, off my mum from me to hurt my mum. That's all he did. So I suppose one of the reasons why I'm telling you guys this is it's a bit of a personal message to my mum. You know, I just want to say thank you. You've been my angel. I absolutely idolise you and I love you. I left the army in 2014 after doing 13 years service. I did four tours of Afghanistan, three tours of Northern Ireland, and one residential two-year posting in Northern Ireland, in Oma, was after the bomb went off. I joined in the army in 1999, yes. Back in the day, it was really tough. Not like it is today. It was like, right, you've done something wrong, you've got two choices. You either get a punch or you get court-martialed. And most of the guys took a punch. And the army broke me down and built me back up again. It gave me an ethos in life. 
It taught me to be strong. It taught me to be courageous. It taught me to stand up for what you believe. I've always believed since leaving the army, if everybody's looking one way and you honestly believe with all your heart, the opposite way is the right way to look. You stand up and you look. You speak your mind. You speak the truth according to you. And that message, especially today, is most important. Really, really important. Because I'm fully aware of what's happening in this world. I'm fully aware of the agenda. I'm fully aware of the plan behind it. And it's not a conspiracy. It's not. You just have to look. There's a, there's a saying. In my head, I think I invented it, but I didn't. You have eyes, but you do not see. You have a voice, but you do not speak. You have ears, but you do not hear. You have a mind, but you do not think. I could go into so much detail about this. I'm not stupid. I left the army and I had a beautiful wife. Uh, and I have two beautiful girls with her. But because of the PTSD, I pushed them, I pushed her away. I became unbelievably selfish. I became so wrapped up in myself that I pushed her away. She loved me. Since leaving the army, I've had beauty, three beautiful ladies in my life who've genuinely, genuinely loved me. And I, I'm very lucky to have that where some people go through their entire lives without having anybody. But I pushed her away. I broke her heart. And I'm sorry. And then I met Amy. Absolutely beautiful girl. We fell in love. And over a period of time, I tried to fight the darkness. But I started doing things that wasn't necessarily good for my health. And it was a mask, it was to not face again my demons from the past, from my childhood, from the army, and I pushed her away. Again, totally my fault, I take full responsibility for one, not being man enough to deal with it, to face up to it. And that breakup was very public to our friends pushed her away again not facing up to anything that I'd been through not taking responsibility not being a man now in my opinion being a man is not necessarily doing what you want to do it's doing what you have to do masculinity isn't toxic not at all there is toxic people there's toxic women and there is toxic men Masculinity is part of being a man. Embrace it, learn to control it, and stand proud. Stand up, defend, love the people around you, your family, and do your duty. That's my opinion. You take care of them, and you put them before you. But I'd lost that identity. I'd lost that ethos. I'd become unbelievably selfish. I'm ashamed by that. And being ashamed by that has made me address it and confront it. In my opinion, being a man is trying to make people's lives who you care about around you better in some way, in whatever way you can. It's like what Jordan Peterson says. Now, Jordan Peterson, listen to that guy, because there's so many people telling you the truth and trying to help you without telling you. He says, you know, at your father's funeral. Be the one people rely on. You don't want to be the crying, quibbling wreck in the corner. That's what being a man is. 
being the strong, dependable one. And then, yeah, it's okay to cry, but don't turn into a victim. You don't want to have a victim mentality. Then I met Maisie. No, I'm sorry, Maisie. I know you love YouTube. Um, I know you're probably cringing at this, but I have to say, you're an absolute legend. This woman is intelligent, kind, unbelievably clever, unbelievably clever. I pushed you away, totally my fault. Your family, you introduced me to your family. Amazing, amazing people. The career she's in, she's gonna fly. She's literally, I'm not gonna tell you what career she's in because she wouldn't appreciate that. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I know she'd probably cringe at this. I just wanna say, I'm sorry. I know you found somebody else now and I'm happy for you, I really, really am. Two years ago, um, my whole world fell in. I talked about the darkness. It's like a wave, you know, sometimes the wave is big, sometimes it's small, you have to ride the wave, knowing full well that eventually that wave will, will go down, you know, it's just a, no. This time, I'm not gonna lie, it always took me out of the game. My mind, my perception, everything went so dark. I went into such a black, dark space that I... Honestly, I didn't think I was gonna get out. And uh, I walked upstairs one day and I could see Maisie on the bed and I could see she wasn't happy. So I finished it. I just, I couldn't do it to you and I knew then that I had to probably be on my own and figure this out. So I pushed you away, I finished it, me, I know I did. You deserve better, I know you did. You deserve so much better, but I couldn't give it to you. But you know this girl was that much of a legend, even though we'd broke up, she saw how much pain I was in and how I was struggling and she still stayed my friend and she still supported me. She was still there for me. But I knew at some point you had to cut loose. You had to for your own happiness, your own sanity, let's face it. For that, I'm, you know, you just, yeah, you just disappeared and you had to. And I get that. But what hurts me is that I never got a chance to let you know how much the help you gave me meant to me and how sorry I was that I hurt you. I have to give a massive thank you to my friends as well. You know, I, I have hearing loss, badly, in my left ear and I've got tinnitus. And obviously when we all go out together, all the boys, we all get drunk, we all have a laugh. And I never wanted to be a victim. I've literally never banged on about, you know, my hearing, they know about it. And sometimes I'm not that trying to hear, <laughs> but I've never purposed, I, I, I don't want to be anybody to change for me. When I was struggling, you know, I've got to say massive thank you to Alice because obviously she was pregnant and obviously she was sober and she saw, um, you know, I, I, everyone's drunk, they don't notice. So I always took myself away because, you know, when there's background noise, I literally cannot hear anything. So I'm almost like trapped in this, this nightmare sometimes. You know, I'm sure people thought in the past that I was being ignorant or I was, I just couldn't, I just couldn't hear him. I mean, she saw, and I think it was Carl's birthday. I know he was going out the week later for a meal and she, I think she spoke to everybody. Look, you know, he's struggling like fuck. He's, he's really struggling. And they all stepped up. So I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky to have such a, an amazing group of people around me. Arms are too. <laughs> I've been, um, the, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because, you know, I'm unpacking everything. I've had to, I've had to go over things and, and because I probably wouldn't be here now if I didn't, I, I had to figure things out. I had to try and understand why I was being like I was, and now some of the actions and some of the things I did, and some of the, it just wasn't, 
Good. And I refuse to take pharmaceutical medication. Refuse. Because I've not got bipolar. I've not got some sort of... It's, it's PTSD. I suffer from PTSD. And... No matter how I try and butter coat it, it is, it is what it is. So for the past two years, I've been learning to be on my own. I've never lived on my own before, completely. I, I, I've never not had a girlfriend, never not had somebody in my life. I've learnt about myself. I've learnt to be on my own. I'm happy on my own. I'm, I am happy. I'm content. I've been healing. I'm trying to be better. I've learnt to forgive myself and forgive the people around me that have done me wrong. I've learned to accept certain things. And I've also understood that true courage is about standing up for what you believe in. And today's society says, you can have free thought, you can believe what you want, as long as it's you believe this. Nah. No, I don't think so. There is a lot more, but I've got to go pick up Macy now. She just called me, Dad, can you pick me up? It's raining. I'm like, okay. Uh, there is a lot more. I, I'm i going to start vlogging more. I'm not, don't, I don't think I can get one out every week. I just don't. But I am going to vlog more. Hello. Get How are you doing? What are you talking about? Say hello. Everyone's gonna to want to know where you are. You've not seen you in years. She's a bit embarrassed. Mm. <laughs> she's a bit, can you remember the vlog we did years ago? She sat there. Nah, she... <laughs> you need to delete that. No, I. Say hello. It's Say hello. Get away. <laughs> Say hello. Hi. See what she did. She did that with a knee, no, razor blade. Did you not? No. Did you not? No. Yeah, Get out. Get out of my face right now. Love you. <laughs> I finally found peace. In my head, in my soul, in my heart. It's, I'm still working on it. It's going to take a long time. One of the things I've had to address and confront and analyze and take a good look at was when I lost my hearing or damaged my hearing. So it was two weeks before I was going to go on R&R &R and um, went on R&R, &R, came back and one of the medics shouted me and I didn't hear them. So they shouted me again, still didn't hear them. And they came up to me and they said, right, Cole Glover, is your hearing okay? And I was like, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. I'm totally bluffing it. And he says, well, I don't believe you. So get yourself up to the med center to get a hearing test. So the results of the hearing test came back and my hearing was knackered and they wasn't gonna let me go forward again. Now at the time, there's a sergeant major called Pete Lewis. Amazing, amazing sergeant major, he was brilliant. And he said to the medics, he says, look what we'll do, we'll put him in the stalls and he can be the stalls to IC. And you know, so he doesn't have to go to the front line. And he's like, no, no, he's not going forward. At the time, the stalls was run by Colour Sergeant called Colour Sergeant Newman. His nickname was Minty. He looked like Minty from anybody remembers from EastEnders. He was the spitted image of this guy. So his nickname was Minty. And another guy that was in the stores at the time was a guy called Brian Tunnicliffe. Now, Brian was an absolute legend. He was, you'd hear him before you saw him because he had a speech impediment and he was really loud. So, and he'd, he'd talk like this, you know. That's not a disrespectful thing. That's just the way he talked. But you'd always hear him and everybody loved Brian. He was he was a, a character of the battalion. And for some reason, he, every time you saw him, he was always pulling a trolley. You know, one of those that's six foot long, about two foot wide, three foot wide maybe, four wheels on it. And you'd transport, I don't know, chairs, tables to different locations around the battalion. He was always pulling them for some reason. And he was an absolute legend. He was, he was the nicest guy you'll ever meet, kind. Um, he didn't have a malicious bone in his body. He really didn't. The sergeant major said to the medic, what we'll do, we'll put Colt Glover in the stores. He can be too icy and he can help run it with Minty. And they still wouldn't let me go forward. So Brian stepped up and he became the two IC. Now, the way it works, when you come into Bastion, you fly into Bastion, you spend a few weeks there acclimatization. And then in your company, you get pushed out to a PB, which is a patrol base. And then, from there, this smaller location is called FOBS, which is a forward operating base. The 
stores guys, the, the, the colour sergeant and the 2IC would resupply the guys who's in the fobs from the PB, which is the patrol base where the colour sergeant and the officers were located. They would use a vehicle called a Pinsgauer. Now these Pinsgauers, they're not the best vehicles in the world. They're four by four vehicles, but they're just, they're just not the best. And the driver and the passenger seat was really tight and compact. There's not much room. And when you're going out uh, resupplying the guys in the fobs you'd have your body armor you'd have your webbing you'd have your rifle your helmet you'd have a pistol um, you may have a day sack so it's really really tight there's not much room to maneuver in there all over Afghanistan um, especially in, in the outer regions it was really dry what the Afghans used to do they'd build um, sort of like canals uh, like really deep trenches and they'd funnel the water off from um, the Afghan river and so they could use that water to irrigate their crops. But they're quite deep and they're quite wide. Anyway. So like I said, Brian stood up and took what would have been my place. And most of the resupplies were done at night time and they'd have to use night vision goggles. And if anybody's ever seen something on Call of Duty or something like that, night vision goggles, it looks green but there's no depth of perception, so you can't, it's really hard to judge when, how far a vehicle is in front, the side of the vehicle, it's, it's just really, really hard to get that depth of perception. Well, on the 20th of September, 2007, Brian and Minty was doing a resupply to the guys um, in the FOBs. And on this particular occasion, they was traveling over um, one of the irrigation trenches over a bridge and they misjudged it and the vehicle ended up tipping over into the trench, leading the vehicle upside down, which trapped them both inside. Sadly, they both died. They couldn't get out of the vehicle, they had all the kit on and they died. And for a long time, one of the reasons I believe why I hated myself so much was I believed that I could have, if I was allowed to go back to the front line, I could have done something, I could have been there, I could have, it may have been a different outcome. Maybe these two guys would have still been alive today. So it's guilt. I've harbored this guilt for so long and not spoke about it. I know it's not my fault. I know it's out of my control. There's nothing I could have done. There's, there's nothing I could have done. Minty left a wife and three children. Brian left a wife. It's, kind of, it's haunted me for all these years and I've never faced up to it. I've never took, never really analyzed it. And I've had to go back and address this so that I could move forward.